Our great Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can call you Father. And Father, we would ask that now you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in a fresh and full way that, that you would show us Christ. And that you would cause our hearts to rise with joy at the thought of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing. God, we, we ask that you would richly bless Eric Tully in Liberia today as he faithfully proclaims your word to brothers and sisters of ours in Liberia. We, we ask that you would give him strength, that you would cause your word to be faithfully communicated and, and powerfully received. Would you build up your church in Liberia, God, that there would be growing numbers of our brothers and sisters there that stand upon the gospel, that delight in sound doctrine, that treasure you above all else, Lord Jesus. God, would you give Eric strength? Would you give him a time of refreshment uh, later today, that you give him sleep for the week ahead of him and teaching at the seminary of, of West Africa? God, would you... We ask, too, for us now as we turn to your word, that, Lord, you would give us joy in Jesus. That, that this joy we see in the Apostle Paul, that we wouldn't write it off as something that apostles only can experience. But, Lord, you would show us, show us Jesus and give us joy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians in your pew Bible, that black Bible in your pew, it's page 1164. And uh, I'm going to read for us Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 uh, through 18, but I'm going to come up a little short in verse 18. I'm going to read through those five words, and in that I rejoice. May God bless the, the reading and hearing of His Word. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial praetorian guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do, do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ, Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. May God bless the hearing of His Word. How do you do that? As a young dad, I was facing my limits again, like, like many young parents, God uses parenting to expose our sin. Do I have an amen? And so it happened again. The kids were disobedient. I, got, I took it personally. I got angry, and I sinned against them. So I repented. I confessed my sin. I asked them to forgive me. And then I'd watch Jenny in almost an identical parenting situation respond to our disobedient children Calmly, cool and collected, tender-hearted and patient, redeeming the moment, pointing our children to Christ. And I'd be like, how does she do that? Who are you? Have you ever been around a person who, when in a difficult situation, handles it in the most extraordinary of ways? This morning, this, this passage that we just read, we see the Apostle Paul responding to a difficult situation in the most extraordinary way. He is joyful. 
as he's chained to a Praetorian guard. He ends this section with those five words, and in that I rejoice. You'll hear me reference it as, and in this I rejoice. Paul is under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier when he's writing this letter. He is experiencing from other Christians in Rome, they are trying to make things more difficult for him in prison. And all the while, he's awaiting his time before the Roman tribunal in Rome to make his defense for Jesus, and you better believe it, his life is on the line. So I don't know about you, but if I were in that situation, I'd be kind of like a little subdued, maybe fearful and anxious, maybe a little anger and bitter towards my Christian brothers who are making life difficult for me. But Paul says, and in this I rejoice. Who are you, Paul? Who is this guy? How can he be joyful? Is this joy just for apostles? It's not just for apostles. Our Lord Jesus wants all of us to be sharing in this gospel joy. So this passage, I want to show you four features of joy generation. The first thing I want you to see is a gospel sit rep. The second thing I want you to notice is gospel advance. The third thing I want to show you is gospel drama, and I'm talking family drama. And then we close with this gospel joy. Anybody want some joy in the room? If you're facing right now strain in your marriage, if you're facing hardship in your parenting, if your singleness is just so pronounced, if you're experiencing difficulty with some kind of work situation where you are feeling more and more restrictions for being able to speak freely about Jesus, there's joy. There's Jesus joy. Gospel joy in any and all situations. So let's look at this first feature of joy generating goodness. Gospel sit rep, verse 12. Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Do you know what a sit rep is? If you watch any kind of military or political show, you know what it is. Let me give you an example. This is Overwatch. Overwatch to Golden Child, give us a sit rep. Gold, Golden Child here. Golden Child, 2330 local time, landed, dug in, 0600, we go live. Golden Child out. Roger that, Golden Child, next sit rep, 530, 0530. Overwatch out. It's a situation report. That's what a sit rep is. And Paul gives the Philippian church a sit rep with that phrase, what has happened to me. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What's happened to Paul in the passage three times, you will see it, my imprisonment in verse 13, in verse 14, in verse 17. He's in prison, he's under guard, he's under house arrest. He's waiting this trial. Notice what Paul doesn't say. Man, the food here in Rome is pretty good. Really interested in some of the architecture. Uh, Philippians, thank you so much for inquiring. I got your note from Epaphroditus. It was, thanks so much. Everything's fine. Nor does he say, he goes into this kind of navel-gazing, kind of like, oh, woe is me business. He, he doesn't do that. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In Paul's mind, his imprisonment is being used by God to make known Jesus. We're going to see the very real ways the gospel advanced in Rome at this time, but, but I, what I want you to see right now is Paul's perspective. Paul was interpreting his situation through the lens of the gospel. Not about his comfort, not about his reputation. His imprisonment is about Jesus, verse 13. And the underlying What's underlying Paul's perspective is an understanding of God's providence. That God is at work in the very details of life to carry out his redemptive purposes around the world. 
right now, brothers and sisters, regardless of how you feel, God is at work seeking to advance the gospel. What is the gospel? Gospel simply means good news. It was, it was a generic term used in the first century. For example, if you're an Ohio State Buckeye fan, the gospel would be the Ohio State Buckeyes beat the Wisconsin Badgers last night. We've got some amens. That's good news for some, bad news for others. There's a lot of different gospels out there. There's the gospel of nationalism that makes the claim that the good life is by buying into this political philosophy or movement. There's another gospel. It's the gospel of pleasure that the good life is found in this experience of bodily euphoria. There's another gospel out there that's very subtle. Carl Truman pulls this out in much of his writing lately. It's called the gospel of expressive individualism. And the idea of that is the good life is something that you define for yourself based upon how you're feeling. The good life is what I make the good life to be and how I want it. The gospel of Jesus Christ says the good life is dying to yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus daily. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God reconciles sinners to himself and brings life in abundance. So what Paul is experiencing here, this sit rep, is that his imprisonment is a means by which God in his providence is bringing gospel life to Praetorian guards. I'm guessing the Philippians would have been a little surprised by this. I'm guessing they wouldn't have expected to read a letter from Paul with his situation to be so full of joy. What's your sit rep? What's the situation you find yourself in? Is it a difficult marriage? Hard parenting? Challenging singleness? Something at work? What we learn from Paul here is he brings a gospel perspective to all of his situations. So brothers and sisters, the difficulty that you're facing, are you actually seeing it as a gospel opportunity that God can and will advance the gospel through it? So the first feature is this gospel sit rep. The, the second feature I want you to see from this passage is in verses 13 and 14. It's, it's the specific ways that the gospel was advancing in Rome while Paul was, Paul was writing this. Now remember, Paul is writing the book of Philippians from Rome while he is under house arrest, and he sent it by the hand of Epaphroditus, the 4,600 miles, to Philippi. And so what Paul reports here is what's happening in Rome, not Philippi. And he says, the gospel is really, my imprisonment has really served to advance the gospel. And, and the first way it advances it in verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul's talking about his personal evangelism in Rome. His imprisonment is giving him one gospel opportunity after another. And here's how it's, here's how it's shaken out for him. What, what, he was chained to a Praetorian guard. The Praetorian guards were the elite guards of Caesar in Rome. And think about it this way. Every four hours, Paul would be chained to a new Praetorian to guard him. And could you imagine in that transition, the twinkle in Paul's eyes when he has a new Praetorian guard chained to him? Talk about a captive audience. Hi, my name is Paul. Nice to meet you, Mr. Praetorian. Can I tell you a story that I hope you will come to believe? I wear this chain for Jesus. Every four hours, six Praetorians a day, 
seven days a week. One gospel opportunity after the other. Do you see how Paul is redeeming the opportunity God has given him in his providence? And the irony is this. Paul's under Roman arrest. And he's evangelizing Praetorians, the elite guard of Lord Caesar, the other Lord of all. And here is Paul, chained to a Roman guard, sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the heart of Rome. The Lord Jesus has Paul exactly where he wants him. The Lord Jesus has Paul sharing the gospel with exactly who he wants the gospel shared with. Have you ever heard the phrase, bloom where you're planted? Paul's been planted under house arrest in Rome, and the bloom is the gospel. And the fragrance being emitted in in that house under house arrest is the aroma of Jesus Christ. And for some Praetorian guards, that was the aroma of life. For others, that was the aroma of death. But Paul was faithful. God was advancing the gospel through his personal evangelism. Hey, do you feel like, um, maybe metaphorically speaking, you're chained to somebody? Maybe you're married to someone who's not a Christian. Maybe you're, maybe you're parenting non-Christians. Maybe you're in a business relationship or work relationship with non-Christians. God has you there. And you've got gospel opportunities lining up. The second way we see the gospel advancing is in verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident, Lord, by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Brothers, of course, is a reference to the other Christians in Rome, many of whom, the other churches in Rome at this time were not planted by the Apostle Paul. So he's brought there under arrest. But this reference to brothers, most of the brothers, most of the Christians, most of the brothers and sisters in the Lord, because of Paul's imprisonment, they are trusting in the Lord more. Their confidence in the Lord has increased. Their faith has been stirred. And, and the way it gets shown is this, at the end of verse 14, they, they're much more bold to speak the word without fear. Bold to pro proclaim the gospel. Fearless in proclaiming the gospel. Confident. It's referencing their the evangelism of the Christians in Rome at that time, Paul's imprisonment somehow, somehow pushed it forward. I'm kind of wondering how. How does Paul's imprisonment compel other Christians to share the gospel more? You remember last week I, I showed you Chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, that, that this is Paul's prayer for the Philippians. In verse 10, he says, so that you may approve what is excellent. And, and what that actually means is to live for what matters most. What's going on in Rome is that the Christians, through Paul's example, are being reminded of what matters most. In other words... The gospel has gotten real in Rome. There's a sister in our church that regularly catches heat for being vocal about her faith in her place of employment. And, and, and you know the effect that it has on me? I don't like, shh, 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 stop that. Here's the effect it has on me. It makes things real. It stirs me to be bold. It stirs me up to take some risks in who I share the gospel with. What is keeping us from confident, bold, fearless evangelism? I have a working theory that it's not a lack of evangelistic training. Could it be the reason why we don't share the gospel 
with such confidence, with such boldness, with, with such fearlessness, and why we tend to be more fearful and embarrassed about Jesus, could, could it be the simple reality that Jesus, he's just not real for us? We don't really think that he matters most. But when we do, but when Jesus becomes real, when he becomes the center of our solar system and we order our lives around him and our different com commitments and responsibilities, they take upon the si same right size and position in orbit to him. When that happens, when we see Jesus for who he is and we're like, he, there's no one like him, what will happen is we're going to want to talk about it. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So here we have the gospel advancing in Rome, Paul's imprisonment. It's, it's advancing through his personal witness to those chained to him, and it's advancing because things have gotten real for the other Christians in Rome through Paul's imprisonment, and now they're sharing the gospel with greater boldness and frequency. The gospel's getting out. The third feature I want you to see is the drama. Gospel drama, I'm calling it family drama, and I'm calling it family drama because the drama is in between Christians. Now, I'm sure you saw in verse 14, and most of the brothers, so there's this huge section of these Christians in Rome that are now sharing their faith more boldly. But then in verses 15, 16, and 17, we learn that there's actually two groups of preachers. In verse 15, we read about the first group. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. These are Christians. And they're preaching Christ from envy and rivalry. And what you need to understand is that's towards Paul. And then there's another group of Christians who are preaching Christ from goodwill. One group is preaching Christ to spite Paul. The other group is preaching Christ to support Paul. And so we have these Christians preaching the one true gospel from very different motives. And how we know it's a motive is from the word from. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but the others from goodwill. It's a little distressing, don't you think? Verse 16, Paul goes on, he says, the latter, those who preach Christ out of goodwill, do it out of love, love for Paul. Knowing that, Paul says, I am here, put here for the defense of the gospel, that, that God himself has providentially placed Paul in Rome in order for the advance of the gospel. And these, these particular Christians who are preaching Christ out of goodwill are like, yes, we support Paul in this. We see it. We see God at work. But the others, verse 17, those from envy and rivalry, we read this. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. That word selfish ambition is everything that you think it means. It's, it's self-serving, it's self-interest, it's in it for yourself. It's the same word in chapter 2, verse 3, in which Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. How is this happening? Out of this selfish ambition, these impure motives, they think that they are afflicting Paul in imprisonment, but through Paul's economy of things, because Paul treasures Jesus above all else, and he has a perspective on things that God is at work in the details, even beyond human motivation. The, the, the deep irony is, Paul is celebrating these Christians with impure motives, preaching Christ, because they're preaching Christ. It's extraordinary. Now, is anybody else in the room kind of shocked that Christians would preach Christ from impure motives? Anybody else? It kind of begs the question, why? And there's a lot 
A lot of conjecture on this. We don't know exactly why this is going on, but the best thing I read this past week was this. Remember, Paul didn't plant these churches in Rome. And so Paul showed up as, as essentially an outsider, and it's pretty safe to say that not every Christian in Rome thought that Paul was fully trustworthy upon his arrival, especially as a prisoner of Rome. So you can see where suspicion could take root. It seems as though there's a group of Christians in Rome that are not convinced that Paul is an apostle placed in, under house arrest for the gospel. So what you need to understand is people can preach Christ from impure motives, for making a name for themselves. I have sinned there. And yet God will use the proclamation of the one true gospel to really change people's lives, even when proclaimed with impure motives. There's warnings in 1 Timothy 6 about doing ministry for greed, to line your wallet. Let me help you think about this a little bit more, because this is not so crazy as it may sound. Think of some other Christian activities that we take part in. Let's say, for example, when you give of your finances, is it possible to do that with impure motives? Yes. Or maybe you're serving on some kind of ministry team as a deacon or as an elder or as a life group leader or a King's Kids volunteer or a King's Place volunteer or with Rooted. Is it possible to carry out your serving from impure motives? Yes. Is it possible to pray to the living God with impure motives? Yes. James 4 says as much. So we shouldn't be too surprised that evangelism can be carried out from impure motives. That doesn't make it okay. But it does mean that God is able to sovereignly work around motives to carry out His redemptive purposes. But I'd like to bring this home a little bit. Because I don't think our problem is preaching Christ from impure motives. I don't think that rings true with us. I think our problem is not preaching Christ at all, which comes from impure motives. Like, I fear my reputation and what people think about me more than making Christ known to them. So before we get all judgy about these first century brothers and sisters in Rome for evangelizing for impure motives, we need to take the log out of our own eye and ask the question of ourselves, how is our evangelism? At least they're sharing Christ. There's family drama going here. We see conflicting motivations going on here. It's sobering because it reminds us that we too, though justified, we still sin. And we can sin in these things that are seemingly should be done with like the most pure of motives. It's very sobering. It also reminds us that the church is, has been experiencing drama within itself for a long time. How would you have responded to this if you were Paul? Would you be like, oh, these people need to be rebuked? Or, I'm going to take my ball and go home. What's striking, and which brings me to the fourth feature of this, is Paul's extraordinary response. Gospel joy. Only that in every way, whether in pretense, impure motives, or in truth, pure motives, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, and in this, I rejoice. Who is this guy, and how can he respond to his situation with that kind of joy? You know what he's saying? He's saying, it's, it's, it's a rhetorical question. It's like, what? 
So there are Christians proclaiming the one true gospel out of love for me and out of spite for me. So what? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Paul is less concerned with people's motives towards him and more concerned with people knowing who Jesus is in order to trust him and live for him. And what we see operating here is Paul's view of God's providence that allows him not to get stuck in what people think about him, not to get stuck in people's motives. In Paul's mind, God is sovereignly at work even when people's motives aren't pure. God can still advance the gospel. Here's another way to talk about it. Paul is far more concerned about the name of Jesus than about the name of Paul. That's why he can rejoice. Because he's all in for Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This word rejoice or joy, it's a major theme through the book of Philippians. You'll see it show up 12 times in the four chapters of the book. And it's extraordinary. And it begs the question, are we to be this kind of joyful? Are we to be like this? Are we to experience like this? Look at chapter 4, verse 9, if you want to flip over that for me. Paul says this. He says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Look at 317, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. This joy that we see and hear in Paul, we are to experience it too. This Jesus joy, this gospel joy. This joy that blossoms in any and all situations because we are rooted in Jesus. Let me ask this question of you. What do you want above all else? What do you want? Do you know what Paul wanted above all else? It is emphatic in this passage. Let me point it out to you. In verse 12, we read this. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Verse 13, my imprisonment is for Christ. Verse 14, much more bold to speak the word without fear, the word of the gospel. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ. Verse 17, verse 16, I've been put here in defense of the gospel. Verse 17, the former proclaimed Christ. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way Christ is proclaimed. Do you know know what mattered most to Paul? That Christ is made known. That people hear and respond to who Jesus is and what he has done, and that through Christ alone, God can reconcile sinners to himself for eternity. I came across a poem 15 years ago. I've got extra copies of this if you would like it. This poem was written by a man named C.T. Studd. He was the Michael Jordan of cricket in the mid-1800s in England. And then God captured his life. And he became a missionary to China and to India. And he wrote this poem I'm going to read it to you in its entirety because it's all worth it. It's called Only One Life. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat, only one life which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish, my, me selfish aims to leave and God's holy will to cleave. Only one life which will soon be passed. 
Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its days I must fulfill, living for self or in His will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when life would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with you to say, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep, faithful and true, whate'er the strife pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone. Bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life. Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "'Twas worth it all, only one life, which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last." Do you think he wrote that sad? I think C.T. Studd wrote that with a heart full of gospel joy, because he's done the math. He knows of Jesus' unsurpassed worth. Now, you may be saying there in your seat, surely this, this, this gospel perspective, this gospel priority, even this gospel joy, hey, you know what? That's for apostles. Brothers and sisters, it's for all of us. Now the question becomes, how? How does this joy we see in the apostle how do we experience that gospel joy? I'll briefly tell you. We prize Jesus above all. Jesus is our greatest treasure. That's the beginning of joy. We see God's providence in every and all situations. That's the beginning of joy. God at work bringing the gospel message to all people. We prioritize the name of Jesus above our own. It's about His name. It's about His salvation. It's about His glory. So, so we prize Him and we, we see His providence. We prioritize His name. And then we live in this paradigm that Paul has given us. There are, were Christians in Rome who were opposing Him. And yet, he's saying... Well, Christ is being proclaimed. You know how helpful that is for us? Especially when it comes to talking about church unity. This is why Paul has it in here. To help this Philippian church start to recognize that their unity as a church is going to be established and maintained through the gospel of Jesus. It's a paradigm for us. We have looked at the sit rep. We have seen the gospel advance. We have seen the gospel drama, and now we've seen the gospel joy. Have you ever been around a person who handles a difficult situation in an extraordinary way? That's what we see here in this brief passage. Paul is handling the most difficult of situations with a gospel perspective and a gospel priority resulting in a gospel joy. And this is why if you're in a hard man marriage, you can also say, in this I rejoice because my sovereign God is at work. If you're in a hard parenting situation, you can say, in this I rejoice. Our youth group is experiencing some challenges right now in, 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 in uniting because we have people there who are very different backgrounds. In this, we rejoice. It's a gospel opportunity. We prize Jesus above all else, and 
our perspective is, is seeing God's providential hand advancing the gospel. We, we prioritize the name of Jesus, and we, we have this paradigm of Jesus' unity that's established on Jesus alone. And so I don't know where you're at, and you may not know how it's all going to work out, but you can say with great confidence, in this I will rejoice. Because God's at work, advancing Christ's purposes for the glory of His name. Let's pray together. God, Father, we ask that you would give us this, this shared mind with the Apostle Paul. That we would be of one mind along these lines. That we, we would live for what matters most and and from prioritizing Jesus above all else, He is our treasure, there would flow Jesus' joy, gospel joy. God, would you show us how you are at work all throughout our lives, eager to make known the person of Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen.